This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney. Today on the download, although we do have quite the, let's say, tumultuous uh, situation going on in the world right now, the stock markets are actually looking pretty good as of the recording of this morning on Tuesday, March 22nd. Uh, with the exception of the Federal Reserve having a lot to say about uh, possible rate increases, uh, everything is mostly doing pretty good. Uh, oil is relatively normalizing, although domestic crude barrel production uh, price is still staying around the $100 to $110 mark, uh, which of course is still very high. But we are starting to see some relaxation of prices at the pump. But there are many factors that are going into what exactly we are seeing there. So with that exception, everything looking relatively um, uh, good. Uh, Honestly, it's uh, the stock market major indexes have come up significantly uh, since last week, uh, signaling a quite um, uh, uh, bullish run on the markets. Uh, However, the main things to look at right now are uh, are with uh, Jerome Powell uh, leaving the door open for a what he says are a 25 basis point rate height increase possibility. Just possibility hasn't necessarily been uh, written in yet, but uh, the possibility for that significant of a rate hike does have people kind of uh, holding the purse strings a little bit tighter. But again, uh, as of this morning, Amazon is trading up over 2%. So even with news like that, it's still kind of a bit of an anomaly as to you know things going that, uh, that well for certain securities, at least on the open tradable markets. Uh, we have news out of Disney. Uh, their employees are uh, still stating that they are st- They are planning on staging a walkout over the Florida bill uh, having to do with uh, education and uh, specifically education and uh, LGBTQ issues uh, in Florida. So Disney's still looking at that and what those possibilities mean for the company is still kind of unknown. But as of this morning, uh, the representatives for the uh, employees of Disney World are still planning that walkout. Uh, Large-scale Russian cyber attacks have been warned by the White House. Uh, We have seen a few companies, especially uh, domestic uh, security firms, that have seen actual attacks by what have been supposed to be Russian uh, players. But the the White House issuing a a very interesting, uh, informative uh, warning to large U.S. firms to shore up their cybersecurity efforts as we can expect to see a large scale uh, attack on uh, certain U.S. companies and governmental agencies by world players uh, in the coming months. Uh, Bitcoin is trading on a two week high despite regulatory concerns. So that's uh, definitely good to know for for cryptocurrency investors is that we are seeing a relatively good price run on uh, large index cryptocurrencies. The large chip and card manufacturer NVIDIA is holding their Investor Day conference today and tomorrow uh, to announce their plans through Q4 or through Q2 and Q4 of this year. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects their stock price with the looming uh, chip shortage, or the silicon chip shortage still being a present player in that market of semiconductors and computers. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of this investor day uh, conference. So definitely something to watch on with regard to tech stocks. Moving into tech and manufacturing, Tesla finally opens their long awaited German, uh, their Berlin gigafactory for the manufacture of Tesla products in Europe. So will be interesting to see how that exactly affects Tesla as we've seen their share prices kind of jump all over the place with about a 10, a 10 percentage point window uh, between Tuesday of this week, Tuesday of last week and this week. So we'll see how this uh, moves to normalize, whether the conflict in Ukraine will drive any type of issues with the production of that plant will remain to be seen. But it is very interesting to see that Tesla did manage to finally open that gigafactory, which broke ground right before the global pandemic hit. One of the big movers that we'll discuss today is Shopify, the uh, shipping and logistics 
uh, shopping company that saw a humongous price increase during the pan during the height of the pandemic when people were ordering pretty much everything online uh, saw their share price and volume cut by almost 70 percent uh, in the past year but over the past week they have seen a rally of over 50 percent on the per share increase since last Wednesday they had a bit of a dip yesterday but it is quite interesting to see just how well that the uh, shares are doing right now uh, most people uh, looking to that as maybe kind of an indication that people are getting back to uh, purchasing and actually buying online as opposed to what other trends have been going on. So that's it for today on the download. Everything looking uh, pretty good at the moment for <clears throat> for large uh, scale investors on the security market. So hopefully next week we'll see a continuation of this these uh, these good news points that we have. Thanks for joining us. This has been the download. Today on the what is, what is the producer price index? With inflation being a very hot button item, I like to bring to you some more information regarding things that you might see in the news uh, regarding what is a measure of inflation. The producer price index is published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and is a corollary to the consumer pricing index. Uh, it is a group of indexes that calculate and represent an average movement in selling prices for domestic products over time. It is a measure of inflation based on input costs and producers. The PPI, or the Producers Price Index, is different from the Consumer Price Index in that it measures costs from the viewpoint of industries that make the products, whereas the CPI, or Consumer Price Index, measures the prices from the perspective of the consumers. This has been The What Is. Another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Today, we're really pleased to welcome the company Nectar. Uh, going to be talking about uh, short-term rentals and uh, rental management today. We have Andre Sandate and Derek Barker on from Nectar. So thank you all very much for being on with us today. Thanks for the invite. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So um, I'll let y'all lead off and uh, kind of give us an overview of kind of you know, what y'all's professional career looked like coming up unto this point, um, you know, how you kind of came to be involved with Nectar and then kind of what Nectar is, and then we'll jump into the nuts and bolts of investing in these kind of uh, asset classes. Okay. Andres, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, I'll just give a quick uh, background. Thanks for having us on. So I, um, I've worked in the, the capital markets and the alternative investment space for really for the last 15 plus years um, in a lot of early stage uh, firms across real estate, private equity, credit, uh, hedge funds, uh, distress, and, uh, and now, you know, bringing a lot of that together um, over the last five or six years in commercial real estate and what it is really a interesting and dynamic and fast moving niche, what we call the short-term rental space. So yeah, I won't, you know, um, I, I won't get into all the details, but it's been a fun run and uh, we're looking forward to talking about it today with your guests. Yeah. And, and I'm, and I'm a, a serial entrepreneur is my, my background really, uh, you know, starting my first, uh, my first business, my freshman year at Harvard, I ended up exiting it junior year and I've been in the real estate business since then. So I started buying properties back in my hometown of Atlanta, uh, senior year. I, after graduating, I, I did do a quick stint trading structured products at Goldman Sachs. So I have some amount of, uh, you know, kind of uh, credit, you know, credit and, and, and capital markets background there. But I continue to build my real estate portfolio. And, uh, and, and since 2013, that's what I've been doing full time. So I started out as a turnaround specialist. Um, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in was super hard hit by the financial crisis. And so there were blighted apartments. And I came back and I would take the most blighted apartment in the neighborhood, gut rehab it, kick out the gangs, you know, make it really nice and make it the nicest property in the, in the neighborhood. And I did about $400 million, uh, $400 million of deal volume in that business typology, um, it, almost 5,000 units all in cities starting in Atlanta, but all throughout the Southeast of California. Uh, and, and, that, and that's what I did before Nectar. But it, it, and, and, and then I uh, 
started uh, started a short-term rental business within that portfolio. I uh, grew to about 125 units, and and uh, and then around the pandemic, decided to to focus more on providing financing in the space and, and, and building that out. Uh, so that, that that's my background. Fantastic! It's always good to hear uh, how people kind of came to real estate because it's uh it's interesting because it's never a straight trajectory. Um, you know, like you said, you went to Harvard of all places, and uh, you know it, it plugged you in there. I went to a small. Uh, private liberal arts school too, and was in business and then got dropped into alternative finance and real estate and, you know, all these kind of different ways that people kind of get involved in it. Um, but uh, the cool, the cool common thread between everyone that does it is uh, you rarely, and I, well, at least I have it in my 10 years of professional experience, met someone that isn't passionate about real estate. Everyone that does it is, you know, whether on they're on the tech stuff um, and platform interface stuff like y'all are, or directly investing, you talk about real estate, it will put a smile on that one person's face. And maybe the whole room's tired of hearing about it because they always hear the person talk about real estate, but it's, uh, it's, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very jovial crowd. So I'm glad to have you all on today. You seem real passionate about what you're doing. So, um, you know, you mentioned Nectar. So what is that? Um, you know, how did, how does this operate in the space with short-term rentals and, and what exactly do y'all do specifically? Yeah, no, nah, great question. So, we started Nectar uh, because during the pandemic, we had a pretty you know, decent sized real estate portfolio um, and financing kind of really dried up. And we were, but we had a portfolio full of, ca- that was making kind of cash flow, particularly our short-term rental portfolio. We we're making record revenues and record profits every month. Um, and that, and that's, and we said, well, there should be, you know, some kind of way to get better terms of better financing with this cash flow portfolio. That's where we came up with the idea of Nectar. And so to answer your question directly, what Nectar does is we give, we go to experienced professional real estate entrepreneurs. We're building uh, you know, real estate, the real estate companies of the future. And we give them advances on the net cash flow that their properties are generating. Uh, and, and we started with the short-term rental space because, you know, and I know I've, I've owned, apartments, single family, short-term rentals, office, retail, but short-term rentals right now make a ton of profit. They have really high margins relative to the underlying asset value. And they have low leverage because banks don't give as much leverage to short-term rental operators as they do to like an apartment owner. So we can step in and provide an advance to the most high qualified experienced operators out there who have less capital for a higher margin business than other spaces in the real estate industry. And that's just because of the novelty. Uh, so that, that's, that's what Nectar does. We provide advanced cash flow based financing to the real estate companies of the future. And we take those advances, package them together into pools and, you know, take pools of these advances and offer them as an investment uh, to, to investors like, uh, like yourself who could just get a passive income that's backed by, you know, experienced professional real estate operators. Okay. So you kind of operate on two sides. So you're doing the um, like actual financing for the, the individual real estate investor and then offering an investment product for people that want to come in and purchase into some type of private placement that is backed by the underlying um, uh, net, you know, uh, block of, of loans that you have, have, have existing out there. Now I want to focus a little bit on, you know, kind of how you're doing uh, the lending aspect and the financing. Are you lending mainly on uh, operators that want to do like improvement capital? Or are you lending for acquisition debt for people to go out and acquire more of these types of properties? You hit the nail on the head. It is both. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the vast majority of our operators are looking, you know, they've done well in the short-term rental business. They, they've, they've done the friends and family route. They've used all their money and their wealth and net worth is in their portfolio. And now that they have this you know, business, they want to grow it. And in order to grow and buy another property, you need more money. And right now the options are you can get debt, but then you can come up with down payment. And after buying 10 properties, you go to investors. Uh, and we effectively uh, are giving people advances on their current net cash flow so that they don't have to get diluted by investors who ultimately are gonna own the property forever and take the you know, big portion of the upside. We allow them to leverage the cash flow that they're generating on their current portfolio uh, to either buy that next property, which is what most of them are doing, um, you know, and, and, own, and own it, own it for all, all outright, or make improvements to their current portfolio. So renovations, you know, we have, you have a good property in the, in the Rocky Mountains. If you got a pool, you'd make you know, 50% more 
you can get an advance to your current cash flow, use that to put a pool in. That, that's what most people are doing. Okay, cool. And uh, what kind of markets are you operating in specifically? Are you trying, trying to say local to the Atlanta market or are you kind of ag- ag- market agnostic as to, you know, you'll lend in someone in California, Washington State, New York, Outer Banks, Florida. Uh, where are y'all trying to mainly focus on your efforts to uh, do these for people that are, or I should say, not sure where you're trying to focus, but where are you seeing people wanting to do the most improvement in this market? Because I think that's what kind of what people want to know. Yeah, I'd say there's really, we are specifically putting together a structuring, a diversified portfolio of cash flow. That's, that is what our, our, that's what our mission is. So right now it's domestic, just so it's in the United States, but we have, uh, we finance people who have properties near Disneyland and California and the beach in Maine and the Rocky Mountains. And, you know, we, we have someone who focuses on traveling nurses in a hospital near a hospital in Kansas, uh, you know, Galveston, Texas, really all over. Uh, and we make sure that each one of these pools that we create is diversified and there's no one market or no one sponsor that's dominating any a pool of income stream so that when we can, so that we, when we sell these fractional shares, you know, fractional shares of this pool to investors, they aren't taking the risk of, you know, one market, you know, something, you know, a, a, a hurricane hits Gabelson and, you know, you know uh, knock on wood for the, my you know, listeners in Gabelson, you know, and, and shuts down the market. We don't want that to impact your entire you know, investment. Um, you know, so that's why every, we, we always make sure that all our, our investments are diversified geographically. Gotcha. I understand. Um, and uh, just one question I have, because I do a lot of the compliance, I do a lot with private equity. So are y'all offering this as a, um, like a uh, unregistered security under Reg D? Is it, is it accredited investors only? Tell me a little bit about if like someone's listening to this and they want to participate, what are the inherent um, like baseline qualifications for doing something like that? Right now, these are 506C offerings. So they are uh, private placement. You have to be an accredited investor. Uh, we will you know, ultimately strive to democratize this and you know, go the reggae route. But to, today, what's available uh, is you know, a, 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 private, it's a private placement. Uh, you're buying the equity stake of a company that enters into dozens of advances. And, and, you know, and that's kind of, and that's in, a five six C investment, and that only applies to the 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 retail investor side of things, not necessarily who you're lending to, right? Right. Okay, exactly. Gotcha. And we're 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 making advances to we are making advances to experienced operators. They have to have at least three years at running a professional real estate company. So doing it full time, uh, not this isn't someone who you know they're renting out their second home or you know they're they're actually a software developer, uh, but they they do this on the side. These are people who, we, we're only making advances to people with professional operations. This is what they're doing. They've been doing it full time for multiple years. Um, that's okay. the type of stuff. Gotcha. I just always like to get that out of the way because, um, you know, we, we have such a diverse, you know, plethora of people that, that work with us that uh, while we do have a ton of accredited investors, um, you know, it's always good for me to at least give a baseline of like if people looking to invest that they just don't kind of you know, jump in unknown. Um, Andre, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to add that one of the things that's been really, really interesting in the first few months um, of us building a wait list is there's a significant amount of pent up demand from non-accredited investors to get access to the short-term rental economy, because effectively these people travel too, right? They go on vacations, they stay in Airbnbs. And what we're you know, what we're on is a path, right? Where initial, the offering, as Derek said, is a, is, is to accredited, but where we think the market opportunity could get really interesting is when you can offer something to, you know, a retail investor, uh, you know, akin to some of the other platforms and offerings that are out there where they can, you know, they can save for college, um, they can save for retirement and they can put away a hundred dollars a month, a thousand dollars a month, um, because the, the the power behind our structure, we think what really makes it unique is not only the background in operating and running a pretty significant, one of the largest short-term rental portfolios um, in Atlanta at the time, so that operator experience, but also the backgrounds that all of the team have in technology and capital markets, in product, uh, having been entrepreneurs. But then most importantly, 
it's a platform that's really designed to empower the real estate investor and entrepreneur. It's not about nectar. What we're trying to do is allow the entrepreneur who's gone out and built a short-term rental portfolio, we're allowing them to keep their upside, right? They're not having to go out and get equity investors and give away 70, 80% of the upside. They can use this instrument to finance the growth of their portfolio, which is good for them. But the investor who wants to access the income streams doesn't have to sacrifice the quality, right? And or take concentrated bets by making a loan out of their IRA to a single operator. So we're trying to really take a big leap from where we think the market is today with high concentration in a specific location and a specific operator Mm -hmm. and offer an investor of instant diversification across what we believe are really the cream of the crop operators in the Airbnb space. And that's not something that's currently available in the market. And it's not something that uh, today uh, an investor has access to. And in you no know, our sort of tagline at, at Nectar is it's a new way, you know, a better way to invest in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Derek, you, uh, you had piped up there. Yeah, well, one, one, when when Andres says a better way to invest in real estate, I think I, I haven't talked a lot about like how the actual how we're different from like investing in a traditional property. Yeah, um, no, let's uh, yeah, because I want to kind of uh, segue a little bit, but let's touch that real quick, and then uh, we'll jump into uh, some of the specifics that we want to get into about the markets in general. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, so the the difference between this and our, our product investing in a specific property is that we advance a, a owner or operator, let's say up to you know 50 or 60 percent of the net cash flow that they're generating. And they're paying us every month uh, straight line amortization. So like effectively principal and interest. So you get a big dividend every month, uh, 40 percent type dividend because you're getting both your return and the principal back. And we uh, automatically reinvest those dividends monthly uh, for, for a period to give you the benefit of monthly compounding. And that's what makes this such a compelling investment because you know, if, you're, if you buy a property yourself and you do great, it, like, you're, it's not gonna, like, you're not gonna be able to every month take the cash from that and buy another property. You just can't scale those operations. We allow for that. For, because we're not buying the underlying property, we're only buying the cash flow. We're getting a, a principal interest paid back, so a big a monthly dividend that then we can reinvest every single month and the and, and that kind of monthly compounding over time leads to you know double digit over twenty percent potential return on investments if you do a long term hold uh, with that type of uh, with that type of uh, structure. So. And just real quick, um, one thing because I'm kind of a nerd on this kind of stuff is that with the underlying investment with this. Um, is the offering actually something where it's just straight line equity of a particular deal you're putting together? Is it structured as a limited partnership? So is there any opportunity for any type of depreciation or amortization pass through on this? Or is it just going to be like an investment into some type of underlying fund where it's just a classification of a share in that? Or is it a, is it a limited partnership stake that the people when they come in and invest in these deals are going to be acquiring? Yeah, they're going to be acquiring a, a membership interest, like an ownership stake in the in an LLC in a company that enters into dozens of advances, enters into you know dozens of advances, and then kind of reinvests for some reinvests distributions for some period, uh, and then makes and then pays out distributions after the initial you know um, compounding period. So they okay. own a stake in this company. Now they don't get the underlying depreciation of the property, of the actual real estate, of actual you know, underlying assets, mm-hmm. because they're only, they're effectively investing in an entity that, uh, you know, that it, that it enters into these advances uh, and, and uh, generates this return that way. Yeah, because they're investing into a company that's effect- effectuating loans, not necessarily effectuating acquisitions, correct? Right. And they're not loans. They're, they, I, I would say like this, it's important to know they're not loans. They're, they're cash flow assignment agreements, um, which have some specific differences that we can get into. I don't know. No, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah we, we don't have to. I, I understand what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, that's uh, as much as I, w- I would love to do it, it would kind of miss the mark with our audience a little bit to like really dig into that stuff. But uh, 
believe me, I I like that kind of stuff. I think it's it's fascinating. Um, but I do too. Um, so on a separate call, we can dig in. <laughs> yeah, next time I'm next time in Atlanta, let's grab a beer and we can uh, we can chat through it. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the markets a little bit uh, because at least from our investor standpoint, you know, our people are you know nose to the nose to the grindstone. They are real estate investors. Um, you know, we certainly have people that like the private equity side of things and they diversify into this kind of stuff. Um, but let's talk about the short term rental markets in general and maybe towards the places that y'all are really familiar with um, and just some of the different ways that people you see participating in these different markets because. There's a you know a million different ways. I mean, you can buy a property and just Airbnb it. There's all sorts of different crazy ways. So I want to get kind of y'all's kind of take on what you're seeing people doing and how they're investing in these kind of things uh, in the short-term rental markets. Yeah. So I mean, we see we see a lot of deal flow. We see a lot of short-term rentals. Uh, so I mean, there's all kinds of interesting business models, particularly with the way people are living and working now. So there, there are a lot more of these medium-term stays, like people who they just do one to three month stays. That's just kind of, or they specifically are targeting an industry. Like you know, I mean, Atlanta, there are people who are specifically targeting the film industry. And so they like they're always booked like like months and months and months out with directors and actors and staff like that do movies or as i mentioned the people the person that does traveling nurses there's like lots of that um campgrounds there's lots of that boat boat tails boat hotels boat, boat tail, uh, we've seen that so we've seen it run the gamut um you know and then there's just the straight up and what mostly is out there is just the straight up vacate i'm a vacation rental you know three days to uh, you know a couple weeks in the Smoky Mountains, and that's just kind of what you know what we do. Um, so, so we're seeing a broad range of people doing all kinds of interesting things. With I'd say the sponsor, like the actual um, short-term rental typology, getting bigger and bigger every day. Like there's more and more of these little niches that people are finding uh, because we're living differently. People are living differently, and we focus on the real estate companies that are building the built environment and the way that we live for the future. Uh, yeah. And that's going to mean, yeah, so that's going to yeah. mean different. Yeah, absolutely. So before I kind of get my next question, I know at least here in Florida, maybe back in 2017 or so, uh, when people, well, I should say legislative and, you know, municipalities were kind of getting used to this stuff, um, you know, there was a big clashing of, of people with regard to regulatory issues. You, you know, beach towns were like, mm -hmm. we don't want this kind of stuff. And then they kind of realized it's like, oh, crap, like these people bring in a lot of money. Maybe we should figure out how to work with them instead of kind of putting up a roadblock. Um, and I'd say most of that for our, the Florida markets has alleviated a lot you know we have you know the beaches of you know pinellas county where i live we have almost 50 miles of fully developed beachfront um i mean it is condos houses from the very tip of pinellas county and pasigro all the way to tarpon springs i mean it is one of the most developed coastlines um in the state of florida minus miami which is miami uh, but <laughs> um i'm a native basically a native florida i got no love loss for south florida i can't i can't deal with it um but the uh are there any markets right now that you're still seeing operators have issues with, with regard to regulatory stuff? Like I said, most of them have kind of gotten on board and said, Hey, okay. So long as these people, you know, like Airbnb and VRBO are collecting like our uh, like hotel and occupancy taxes and they're collecting sales tax uh, because most States collect sales tax on rental revenues that are short term. Uh, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're okay with it. It's going to be kosher, but are there any places where you're seeing clients Maybe places that y'all aren't even wanting to invest in just because of the regulatory issues that are still going on with some of those um, particular markets. There absolutely are. I mean, things are things have calmed down, and there are more and more markets where you see like government and uh, the private sector and the public sector working together to make it so that you know, so the public sector they get their taxes so they can like you know, I guess fix the streets that all the visitors are you know messing up in the private sector. They can be innovative and do what they should be doing, which is creating uh, you know, you know, innovation and in, 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 in commerce. Um, and that's happening more and more. There are cities that are just not that are and not even like a lot of this like these municipality by municipality thing. And there are tons of municipalities, thousands of municipalities in the country. And yeah, so there are some that we just don't really operate in because either they have pending legislation or they just are like outright and you know fighting uh, the the private sector. 
uh, we focus specifically on markets. Is that more, is, instead of a, who we're gonna not focus on, we focus more on what are the, what are the rules on the books? Is the municipality collecting taxes? Are there laws in place? If there are laws in place and municipality is collecting taxes, then for us, that's like, okay, you're not gonna cut it. Like you know, what municipalities don't love doing is cutting off sources of revenue. It's just like, that's not what they're set up to do. <laughs> so that gives that is what gives us comfort. And then we also only financing existing professional operators. So some of these municipalities that have stricter rules are better for us because we're, we're financing incumbents who they already have the, you know, they already have the relationship with the municipality. They had the fight three years ago in 2017. They already had the fight. Now they're good. You know, they have the application or the whatever the um, different municipalities require, and they're you know paying their taxes. And this is what we look for when we're uh, looking at a market. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense because you know, from from a professional standpoint, especially if you're doing some type of you know financing and i use again using the term financing very generally here um just as the term of injecting capital into a particular market uh for the purposes of utilization for these people um you know you don't want to necessarily go into one that's still you know kind of an unknown if there is still if they if they have all this kind of stuff in place and people have gone through it then you know if they're still there then you know they still have probably a good basis for continuing to be there um so, you know, with that said, that's kind of the big one that a lot of people had failed to realize in the past. But what are some of the things that, about the short term rental market um, that people, you know, maybe that are just getting into it uh, or don't don't necessarily realize at first glance? I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, um, you know, buying property in general, you know, OK, great. You know, I have bought a rental portfolio and I've been doing this. But what are some p- things about the, you know, STR markets that people just don't realize uh, or some kind of good things to to be aware of if people are looking to get into this kind of market. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll I'll do I'll answer really quick, and uh, Andres, I know you have a, a thought here. Um, the, the two things, like quick, one is uh, how hard, like it's not like a long term rental. It's just not the same. It's like you're building a hospitality business. That's not the same. Like so, like I say, from a operational intensity perspective. It, whatever you're thinking it is, if you haven't gotten into it, it's like it's, it's more intense. Uh, if you're gonna be a top sponsor, so let me just like preface it with that. We only work with people who are like you know five star reviews, super hosts, and just and that's how you get the most money out of it, and that's how you're the most resilient in a downturn by being the best in the market. And if you're gonna be that, it's hard, like it's hard work. Um, another thing is the financing, the capital markets are just not as favorable. So like with the with a apartment, you're going to be able to go to, once you get a stabilized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and they'll give you 80% leverage, and it's going to be a super low rate, and you're going to get a ton of money out, and then you're going to have the issues with that. But, you know, there's, there's that. With short-term rentals, there's there's not the leverage, which, and that's why we exist, because there are these high margin businesses that quality people are, are, are in, that there's just not the leverage there. Uh, so you have to come up with more money out of pocket for the down payment. Um, I'd say those are two things. And then I guess the, la- and the last thing is that once you get it set up and get things going, it's very high margin. You can make a lot of money. Yeah, you, can, you can like, you know, you can make a, and be taking a lot of cash flow home. And like that's, uh, uh, and it's decently resilient, even, even as the market fluctuates, because you get paid up front before the guest comes to the house. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Andre. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to just uh, add a couple of points. I mean, I think, I think, at a very high level, I mean, your investors, your clients at Avanta, I mean, they're active entrepreneurial investors looking for deals, syndicating deals, et cetera. And the IRA is a great, you know, instrument to deploy capital, to lend capital, et cetera. So it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. I think how I'd frame it uh, to sort of piggyback on what Derek said is you have the short-term rental economy, which is maturing, right? And I sort of look at it sometimes akin to what the single family fix and flip business has become today. So if you go back and look at single family fix and flip, you and I and Derek probably, and many of your listeners probably knew and still know the entrepreneur out there that's buying, you know, fix and flips and doing that model in their local market. Maybe they've gone regional, maybe they've now gone national, maybe they've gone from doing the work to now being a hard money lender. But what you cannot deny is that 
Wall Street and the capital markets saw these guys making money and moved in a major way over the last 10, 15 years. And that's not forced out the one, two, three person team. They can still make a lot of money, but it's gotten harder. It's gotten more competitive. The margins have come in. And so what we see in short-term rental is the exact same phenomenon that's, you know, that's, that's just getting started. Derek mentioned bifurcation. We get a lot of calls from entrepreneurs who look very, very hard at getting into becoming a host. But because of a variety of reasons, Derek articulated the operational intensity, the cost of just acquiring real estate today has gotten super expensive everywhere where you want to be anyway, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And one thing and, that really, kind of, sorry, go ahead. Finish up. No. And so, so you've got operational intensity, you've got the cost, then you've got permitting taxes, zoning, building costs, licensing, all of that myriad of issues and red tape that you've got to deal with. So what ends up happening is a lot of them say, we looked at, ran the numbers and our investment team decided we wanted to get into short-term rentals but we didn't want it to be as active, maybe sometimes due to age, maybe just as a diversification play. We came across Nectar. You guys look like you offer a more passive way for us to get the exposure. And so we start down that path and have that conversation. I don't think that you can discount the regulation. I don't think you can discount the fact that the industry is going through a significant bifurcation. There's now institutional capital coming to play in that same sandbox akin to that single family rental phenomenon. It doesn't mean there won't be opportunities. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't uh, places for the individual investor and the entrepreneur to participate. We definitely see that. We definitely want to support that. That's why our model exists, because we want those entrepreneurs to be able to go from three to five units, from five to 10 units, from 50 to 100 units without having to go and give away their upside. They've done the work after it's all said and done. They should keep the upside. That's why we exist. But I also want to, you know, make sure that that folks take away that the the diversification that you get from a model where somebody is aggregating those income streams into one portfolio versus you trying to go out and make sure that you're doing the right underwriting to get into the right hard money loan. There's just a there's a lot more work, right, in in doing that. So. We yeah. like that juxt juxtaposition um, and we have that conversation literally every day with, with entrepreneurs and investors who are thinking about getting into the space. Yeah, and absolutely. And before I kind of get into my next part where I want to focus on like the, the um, actual end use case uh, for the investor using someone like Nectar is that one of the big things I've seen and it's just kind of, you know, goes to show of, of what people are doing, talking about changing markets, you know, here where we are in Florida, I'll just again, use an example because I live here. Uh, you know, the fix and flip market has really been taken over by the institution of the Black Rocks, the, the large REITs and everything, just because the, the price are getting so high and, you know, they, they don't mind, you know, when you're buying in tranche and you're buying, you know, 100 properties that, you know, 2% ROI um, or, you know, your cap rates being so low on that stuff, it's okay on an economy of scale, but when you're trying to buy three properties, with a, you know, not even making a full percentage cap rate on everything, a, you're not doing that. Um, so with the prices of everything, how they've come up, you know, when you start talking about, okay, well, if I buy a $400,000 property and I can get, you know, $2,800 a month in rent on it, you're really starting to look elsewhere for that. But when you say, hey, I can buy that, let's say $400,000 property and I can potentially be making $15,000 a month, maybe in short-term rental income, that's when people are really starting to shift over and say, okay, I can deal with this high price. You know, I can say, okay, you know, as when I was looking at the 180, 250, $300,000 properties, making that jump to where, you know, my nut, you know, on making that whole different spread on the upside of the increase in price cost is being made up on, you know, let's just say a, a marginal year of short-term rental. If I can pull in at least 10 grand a month, you know, after expenses and everything, let's say you're making, you know, 60 grand in a year on just rental income, as opposed to what you might've been making 
the additional headaches that come in with, you know, fast turnarounds, the additional taxes and everything still make it an extremely attractive environment for people to get into just because of how the institutional money and the pricing has come into the single family space. So I think that is really something that people, you know, need to realize is that while yes, you are seeing a, a, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it is a significant difference in management of a short-term rental versus a long-term tenant. You stick a long-term tenant in there, they might call you once because the water heater takes a crap. Short-term rental people expect you to be coming, clean linens, everything's cleaned, they got it, and then you got to turn around, clean it, get it ready back, back ready for the other people. You might be paying 7% sales tax, you might be paying you mis- municipal taxes and like hotel and occupancy stuff. But at the end of the day, when your rent number per stay is going to be a, easily a double X multiplier of what you're talking about with single family, the numbers make sense that, you know, you're getting well compensated for your headache. <clears throat> so when it comes into, you know, kind of what y'all do, I want to kind of get, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the aspect of the investor side coming to you. It's like, hey, you know, I have $100,000 of capital. I really am, you know, not someone that wants to deal with tenants, toilets, turnovers, taxes. So I'd like to get some of the exposure to that market. Uh, you know, I get it. You know, you have the product where it's a private placement, you're investing into an LLC, you're getting, you know, some type, you're getting that investment income from that. From me as the operator, let's say a short term rental, and I have a need for additional capital, you talked about it, like you said, finding hard money, or going institutional and giving up a big chunk of your upside with an equitable stake in what you're doing. What is that? What does that look like when I, you know, when I, if I were to call up Nectar and say, hey, look, here's my need for additional capital. Uh, you know, what's the big that I'm paying to y'all, um, you know, for that? You know, what's, you know, how exactly are you collecting on that to make the money for your investors? And also, what does it look like for me that's more advantageous from using a service like this as a short term rental owner operator um, going this route? Yeah. So, so like we give people an advance in their net, ca- net cash flow. And what we do is we just look at how much money they have coming in over a term, let's say one to five years, but typically let's just say three years. And we'll buy that a portion of their net cash flow at a discount. So if you're making 50,000 a year, uh, it's 150 over three years, we'll say, look, we'll buy up to $100,000 and we'll pay you 70,000 today for it. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, and with that, so and what that like the cost of capital for like the average you know sponsor is going to be somewhere around like twelve percent on the initial advanced amount, um, but they're paying an income stream. So the, the is not a loan, but the, I think about it as re, you're getting the return of capital, or you're paying the return of capital and the interest in equal monthly installments over the course of the term. Um, so, but it was tw- about 12% on the initial advance, some, something in that range, which is, you know, is, is more expensive than debt, but you have debt, you're, you know, you have a mortgage, uh, and this is something that you can use for a down payment, uh, and it's still cheaper than having a capital partner who's going to stay with you forever, you know, we go away in a few years, capital partner, they, they stay with you forever, and then they get, you know, 70, 80, 90% of the appreciation that happens as well. Yeah, absolutely, and that's- we also- Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we also, I think one of the things the operators and, and uh, you know, hosts um, like about this product is, you know, we're not taking a lien on the property, right? So um, it doesn't throw off, you know, their debt to income ratio. They are not, you know, going to see Nectar necessarily when, when, you know, they go apply for a mortgage. Um, and we also unlike a traditional hard money lender, you know, if they don't make that minimum monthly payment from their net cash flow, it's not like an event of default, right? So there's there's different mechanisms that we put in place, frankly, that are far more supportive, we would argue, um, and, and accommodative to the a seasonality of the business and where the business is, which I think as you get into the discussions, um, you know, and your questions, we'll probably be able to help educate, you know, those that are out there that are looking for different financing options. Okay, gotcha. So essentially you are coming in and lending on, and obviously we don't have to get in specific, but you have, you have a form, a formulaic, you know, outlay of how you look at, you know, what the cash flows are 
and, you know, obviously the amount that you're willing to lend. Um, and then are these terms um, typically, like you mentioned, three years? Is it something where it's typically like a minimum of three years? Is it something that AMS out a little bit longer or you do shorter? What's like kind of the typical like deal structure you see with the end user or the owner operator for how long um, that this, uh, you know, revenue purchase agreement goes on for? Yes, yeah, typically one to five years. I say the uh, one to five years are the, the, those are the terms that we extend. Um, a typical term is three years, uh, but it's a barbell. A lot of people want to do one year. They just want to get the money, do the renovation, get it out the way, and then get on with getting their cash flow back. Um, uh, you know, some people it's like they say, okay, well, I just want to get as much money today as possible because I need to buy this duplex and I need, you know, I need eight hundred thousand dollars. I need three hundred thousand dollars to pay to put the down payment on, and with my cash flow, I need to sell it five years, and we get compensated for that. So that's and, and they and they pay for that, and and you know we have less leverage, so so that is you know we have the safety there, and they have to have reserves. But that's I say mostly one year, five year, and three year with three year being most typical. Okay, gotcha. And, um, you know, we're kind of getting towards the end of it. I want to make sure that we cover a, a few different things um, from the investor side of things, because we certainly do have people that would be looking for this again, because with how expensive real estate is, if you can get something where you can acquire, you know, additional, and again, I use the term financing very loosely on this. If you can acquire financing based on the cash flow mm -hmm. and not maybe necessarily the un just you know, a lot of lenders will look on cash flow, but they'll also use a large chunk of that of the underlying value of the asset and the debt to income ratios as well. With regard to this, um, you know, what are some of the ideas that you mainly look on on qualifying the people that are borrowing? So things like, you know, host, manager, you know, cash flow requirements. What are some of the things that you specifically look for in that on determining the end user that's going to be acquiring capital from Vector? Yeah, yeah. So we look at the Number one thing is the quality of the actual cash flow. So we look at how you've been performing over the past couple of years and how much and what your margin is, how stable it is. Of course, there's seasonality, but we have data for the market seasonality in every market and the best sponsors outperform. So we just we want to see you're making this margin every month for a long period of time. We look at your host rating. We make sure that like you're you're we do a, a review of the review a review of the reviews, you know, a summary of the reviews um, in an automated fashion. So we make sure that you're actually a good host, quality host, that you're, you actually have professional full-time management. So it's not for somebody who's like doing it on the side, you know, that's a, another thing. And then we require just cash reserves. So we, you know, whether it's us, you know, whether you're taking part of the advance and just putting it in a reserve account or whether you just have that reserve to your balance sheet, we want to make sure that you have three months of expenses of cash just sitting there in your balance sheet. So because who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, so, we, it, so we require that there, you know, we look at your experience, your actual quality of cash flow, but then we require a three month reserve so that whatever happens, you'll still be okay. You'll be able to weather the storm uh, and you know, we'll still be able to you know, ultimately make our investment, our returns. Yeah, and uh, also what are some of the kind of maybe the you know, less obvious risk factors um, from both sides of, of this coin. Obviously, the the big one to say on on the borrow, or, I said the, the people acquiring the capital from Nectar are that, um, you know, let's say you know the the revenues for whatever fall off a cliff, or you know St. Pete Beach decides, you know what, we hate Airbnb and we're going to outlaw it, kind of like Austin did with uh, Uber, um, which really sucked because I was actually in Austin when they canceled their like people being able to use Uber, so. That was really fun to get around. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like stuff like that happens, obviously not as much anymore because, you know, the the people in power have seen a lot of the benefit of how much, you know, tax revenue comes in the businesses that are out there like, hey, look, you cut this stuff off, you know, I can't sell cheeseburgers seven days a week, so don't do that. Yeah. Um, but what are some of me, you know, maybe kind of the risk factors that are maybe less obvious on both sides of the coin, you know, from the people coming in investing with you, and obviously there's a lot of correlation and, and crossover with that, um, you know, but I always like to, you know, obviously in these things cover uh, all the great benefits, but with anything it's in investing, it's weighing risk versus reward. Yeah. So here are the big risks. Uh, the one we're we're not as worried about the regulatory risk, not because it's not a big risk, but because of just who we focus on. We focus on people who are incumbents. They have the permit. They've already dealt with the right and in markets that are they're already taxing. There's already like something in place. 
Um, so like that just reduces that risk. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's still there. Our risk is that there's a 40 to 50% year over year decline in net cash flow for someone who's been operating a stabilized portfolio for multiple years. So that's a, you know, that happens and then it's sustained. So we have the right to, you know, recoup. So if you owe us 6,000 a month, you have a month, you take 5,000. We have the right to either take 7,000 next month or to extend the term uh, indefinitely to get paid back. So it has, we, our, the real risk is that kind of big, big decline sustained over long periods of time. Um, and we have like, rights. So if, you, if it's your manager is underperforming, all the markets we're in, we're kind of in touch with the top operators in the, in the market. We have the right, if you are, you know, hit some triggers like underperforming for a certain amount of time, we have the right to fire your manager and replace them with the top quality sponsor. Uh, so that's one way we, you know, mitigate that underperformance risk. And then one that, uh, and another risk is CapEx. You know, ultimately something happens, the house needs a new roof. Uh, you know, there's the, the HVAC, uh, you know, go, you know, goes out and that's the big expense. And that's, that's something that is asynchronous with the market. So, you know, stock market down doesn't mean the roof is going to have to be replaced. Um, but it is a risk that's there. And that's why we only do a certain amount of the cash flow. We make sure that they have cushion, that they have additional cash coming in. We make sure they have that liquidity reserve so that if something happens, they pay it, they slowly refill that reserve back up. Um, we make sure that they have insurance, you know, tornado comes, tree falls down, you know, insurance covers it and there's, you know, income insurance also. Um, uh, but that, but that, those are the, the big risks that, uh, you know, that, and that ultimately we have to assess and get compensated for, uh, given the, the rate of return that we, uh, yeah, you know, that absolutely. We Andre, you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to cover the investor side, the cash flow buyer side of, of that question. So I would say, you know, the risk factors, look, Nectar is a, is a, you know, year and a half, two year old company. We've just started doing transactions. We've done, you know, multiple transactions, but a lot of investors want to know, you know, how much cash flow have you financed? You know, how many of these agreements have you done? So, you know, whenever you're a new company, a new fintech company like we are, people want to see this, you know, longer track record. So there's the new startup risk, number one. I think number two, it's illiquid, right? So this isn't a liquid private placement. So people ask, you know, how do I get my cash back? How do I get my capital back? It's targeted as a three to four year investment. But as Derek alluded to earlier in the podcast, the idea behind it, you know, and where there's, I think something really special and unique about what we're building is the power of compounding. And so that, you know, you benefit from the compounding of that high amortization of principal and interest. Um, if you leave the cash invested and you let us roll it over every month into additional cash flows, but that presents illiquidity, right? So there's that illiquidity that you 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 say one day, hey, I want my fifty thousand or hundred thousand. We'll you know make the first offer as the sponsor on the cash flow, and if you know if we're not interested in buying it or can't buy it for whatever reason, then we'll go to our wait list of investors. So we always tell people the the liquidity, and then I think third is is just people understanding what the instrument, what the product is. A lot of times it gets compared to X, Y, or Z. And that's why these podcasts and these conversations are super helpful um, because we just want, we, we want to de we want to decrease the education risk. Like people should not invest in things that they don't understand. They shouldn't invest based on just the, the potential for a high return, you know, um, especially when you're talking about retirement. And so we're always trying to really get to suitability and make sure we understand what's the investor's goal. What is their awareness of the illiquidity? What is their awareness of the fact that this is an alternative uh, asset class? And I think when we do that and we have those conversations, you know, a lot of times people come out really saying, wow, I didn't know it worked that way, but the education part is, is just critical to get right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you mentioned, um, honestly, I mean, the, the deal kind of exit or liquidity uh, horizon really isn't too far off the mark from what we see a lot of times. I mean, if you're investing into, you know, most of your limited partner apartment deal syndications, I mean, those typically have a five-year window just because they're trying to at least capture all of the accelerated depreciation uh, schedules and, you know, things like uh, <clears throat> that, like that. So, I mean, you know, you can do those over five years. So typically they try to have an exit strategy at that point. 
So, I mean, you know, three to five is kind of right in that wheelhouse, but, you know, a lot of people, when they come in from the side of investing in real estate, you know, they think, okay, I see a market horizon trend coming on. I want to sell my properties. You know, that's a three month process or people coming in from the straight, you know, uh, securities trading side of thing where they have market makers that are constantly being able to, you know, take volume and execute trades. Uh, it's definitely an important thing to understand that I always like to make sure, at least if I don't make that point, thanks for making it as the guest. Uh, but anytime we're talking about private placements uh, or anything that is not a uh, registered security, essentially it's something that's traded on a, a, a regulated stock exchange, you understand the uh, illiquidity of that type of investment. Just meaning that if you're really kind of new to this, just meaning that you can't call Advanta up and say, hey, sell this, or you can't necessarily market it to another friend of yours. Um, because I would, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, these are restricted assets, meaning that the underlying investor can't turn around and sell it, even if it's to, um, you know, like Jane and Harry down the road, uh, you know, that want to buy it, they would have to come as a new investor, they can't acquire an existing share from an existing, um, you know, shareholder, is that correct? We, they have to sell it to us first. And then we have the right to sell it to, you know, really whoever we want, like a customer of ours. Yeah. Yeah, so they don't have external um, uh, execution on that. So, okay, it makes sense. And that's that's more or less standard across all of this kind of stuff. And that's written into the regulations for selling these kind of securities for the most part too, is so that they're non-marketable. So I always just like to make sure people understand that. Again, a lot of people that come into this understand that, but the last thing I want to do is miss the mark on someone new to this that's interested in it to not understand that. Andres? Yeah, just one one final bow on the on the discussion around sort of risk factors and talking about you know the the product. We you know we we get the benefit of talking to a lot of investors throughout the process um, and a lot of entrepreneurs, right? We're a marketplace. Um, one of the things that's interesting is um, investor psychology. There always is a desire to put a product, a strategy, a manager, an offering, a sponsor in a bucket, right? And how you're not different than, or you are similar to, or you're this version of, right? And of course, um, that that is just how it is. And we we understand that and accept that. I want to make sure we, you know, at least I wrap up my thoughts around making it clear to investors like what Nectar is and what it is not. So what we are not is we are not a traded instrument that you can go out on an exchange like a like a publicly listed REIT. I think we've stressed that point, but we're also not owning and, and building and constructing a portfolio like a non-traded REIT or a traded REIT of like underlying property. What we are giving investors is an opportunity to own through this offering an op, uh, a, a portfolio of diversified, stabilized cash flow and income from top short-term rental operators around the country. I mean, full stop, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah. And it's not the underlying property. And so we won't get into it again about, you know, what's your collateral. We talk a lot to investors about what it is and making sure they understand what it is. When they understand what it is and they understand how we approach the underwriting and how we source these cash flows, then just like probably every sponsor that's has an offering that's probably been on your show, then I think as you provide that education, they are able to, you know, go through their diligence like they should. Then I think, you know, there's a certain percentage of them will say, Hey, I'm, I'm interested in learning more. How do I learn more, et cetera. So just wanted to stress that we're, uh, we're excited to come on and, and provide that education because it is a really exciting asset class. A lot of people are trying to find ways to get into it you know, passively, actively, somewhere in the middle. And uh, we're, we're just glad to, to, to be here and have the platform to talk about it. Absolutely. Great. And thank y'all both for both being on today. Uh, we like to keep these wrapped up to about 45 minutes. So we're hitting right up on that. Uh, this is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney. If they want to get in touch with either of you or uh, get more information on Nectar, how do they do that? Uh, you can send, a, send us an email um, or you can go to our website and get some information and, you know, join the way that's directly there or send us an email. Uh, what's, what's our email address, Andres? Uh, so go to our website at www.mynectar.co to get information on that website. You can join um, 
our mailing list. You can request information. Um, we have an active social media presence. We are constantly putting out content. Um, you'll find us out there at My Nectar uh, is our tagline. We also, uh, as Derek alluded to, you can email us at investors at mynectar.co if you have questions and, um, and feel free to engage. We're, we're excited to answer questions and talk to investors and talk to entrepreneurs out there that are looking to get active in the space. Fantastic. Well, again, thanks for joining us today. This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.